Our lecturer today is Professor Andrew Kirk. He is a professor of history and the chair of the history department at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Um, he also runs a very successful um, public history master's program there at UNLV, if there's any students here looking for uh, to, to continue some studies in public history. He earned his bachelor's and master's from the University of Colorado, Denver, and his PhD from the University of New Mexico. He is a prolific author and presenter at conferences with um, many books and articles and, uh, and, and a, long, an a really long list of publications under his belt. Um, some of the monographs he's published include Collecting Nature, The American Environmental Movement and the Conservation Library, published in 2001 by the uh, University of Kansas Press. In 2011, um, Kansas published Counterculture Green, The Whole Earth Catalog and American Environmentalism. And most recently, the book he'll be talking about today is Doomtowns, The People and Landscapes of Atomic Testing, published in 2017 by Oxford University Press. I should note that just last year, this won the Best Book Award um, from the National Council on Public History. He's also the recipient of a number of grants and has been the principal investigator or lead scholar on a large number of public history projects and initiatives around the West, focusing on the environment, public lands, and recently atomic testing. He is somewhat unique in how um, he is a prolific traditional historical scholar and also a prolific public historian. And uh, one thing that you'll, if, if you pick up his book and flip through the first half, which is the graphic novel, and the entire second half, which is sources and methodology, um, you'll see that his traditional scholarship makes him a better public historian and his role as a public historian strengthens his traditional historical scholarship. It's a real model that I think uh, many people in the profession should follow. So, um, join me in welcoming Professor Kirk. Uh, th thank you, Brendan, and thank you to the Red Center for having me here for this nice event. It's really a pleasure to be here, and this is the first time I've been able to present this topic in Utah, uh, even though Utah is a primary subject of the research projects that led to this and a primary subject of the book. So it's really a pleasure to have a chance to talk about some of these things here, uh, right in a zone that was part of the history. So I want to start with a quote here. Dead center in the target is the Nevada. She is still a handsome bandwagon. Something about her gracefully pyramiding superstructure appears designed for beauty first and utility second. She is painted all red now as a better target and is a ship of singular beauty. That quote comes from Dr. David Bradley, a physician who was sent to the Pacific to witness atomic bomb blasts in 1946 and conduct radiological research on mice to try and predict what effect radiation might have on humans. That same year, journalist John Hershey published his extended essay, Hiroshima, based on oral testimony from A-bomb survivors in Japan. Like Hiroshima, Bradley's No Place to Hide offered a first-hand perspective on scientific uncertainty and atomic consequences at the very beginning of the Cold War. This quote about the first series of post-war atomic tests has always resonated with me, both literally in the form of the ships at Bikini in 1946 and figuratively in the form of the states of Nevada and Utah that were soon to be dead center in the target of atomic testing. The USS Nevada and Salt Lake City obliterated off the beautiful shores of Bikini offered a symbolic preview of what was to come when nuclear testing moved back to land. There are literally millions of primary documents related to atomic testing. Libraries full of atomic history books, including Pulitzer Prize winners. Articles and news stories by the tens of thousands. If you read these books and dig through this vast archive, you'll learn amazing things about the technological and political aspects of nuclear history. But until recently, you wouldn't learn much about the people living, working, witnessing, supporting, protesting, experiencing this history in beautiful, complex, and underappreciated ecosystems. 
Despite a wealth of atomic history, the environmental and lived accounts of this globally significant history are not well understood outside the regions where it all happened. With the passing of generations, even in the region, um, the more nuanced version of this history is fading. Doomtowns is the end result of a decade-long public history project designed to add some of this missing perspective. Both the book and the public history projects that preceded it worked to subvert the polarized meta-narratives of atomic testing, a cold warriors versus protesters and victims stories that shapes even the best of the histories. The public history projects also sought to overcome the so-called atomic sublime, the iconic mushroom cloud images and technological spectacle that intentionally and unintentionally prevented fuller understanding of the testing regions and distracted the public from the vexing uncertainty of atomic testing effects on environment and human health. The citizens of the broader Nevada test site region, the people of Nevada and Utah specifically, lived the atomic Cold War more directly than any Americans and nearly as closely and dangerously as the mannequins, soldiers, and various test animals placed in the desert by the Atomic Energy Commission to test radiation effects. Even in 2018, scholars and interpreters of the atomic West must prove that these regions are not and never were empty, worthless wastelands. Prove that this history involved complicated human actors with agency proved that it all happened in real places that had value and cultural meaning to a wide range of people over a long span of time. Hiroshima and No Place to Hide remain two of the most important books on atomic testing because they drew on oral histories and witness accounts at a time when the world needed testimony from ordinary people to grapple with a new nuclear reality. We wanted to do something similar for this region and, this, and the people of this area with our projects. So let me start by telling you a little bit about our oral history projects that got me involved in atomic history to begin with. Share some of the insights about atomic history revealed by public history research. And then try and explain how and why these revelations led me to think about an alternative form of research result delivery, graphic history, like a graphic novel, and some of the method behind that madness. The Nevada Test Site Oral History Project was funded by the Department of Energy, then the Department of Education, and finally the U.S. State Department. And really, it was a series of pub three public history projects that became linked. Uh, the contrast among participant testimonies demonstrated profound and lasting regional tensions and contradictions in understanding of this very complicated set of events. The purpose of the oral history project and the research that resulted was not to reconcile the range of opinion or to correct or any, anyone's view, but to increase the understanding of the complex and contested nature of the life in the atomic age. Nevada was chosen as a test site because officials believed that both the people and the landscape could be contained. A culture of secrecy was critical to this mission and worked so well that we needed a DOE information officer to help us during the oral history project to convince interviewees that it was now okay in the early 2000s to talk about things that they had been forbidden to talk about since the 1950s. So doing oral histories of secrecy is a huge, hugely complicated thing to do. The NTS occupies a massive swath of mountains and valleys in southern Utah, established as, as a bombing range in 1941. As many of you know, this is a beautiful meeting ground of the Mojave and Great Basin deserts and one of the most fragile ecosystems in the world. 
The Paiute and Western Shoshone claim the entire region as Nueve Segovia under the 1863 Treaty of Ruby Valley. During two generations of protest, Western Shoshone tribal leaders issued passports to the test site lands and protested the confiscation of ancestral homes steadfastly at the gates and in the courts. Much of the bombing range bordered the remarkable Desert National Wildlife Refuge created in 1936 in what was then one of the least disturbed bighorn sheep ranges in the Southwest. Ranchers had lived through the area for three generations by the time the military claimed the land as empty. Mormon ranchers and a range of settlers who lived on the vast eastern borders of the NTS were literally on the front lines of the Cold War. Prevailing winds swept radioactive material straight across their lands time and time again. Their children were the first to die from un still unexplained leukemia clusters, and towns like St. George and Cedar City, documented by Dorothea Lang and Ansel Adams at the height of testing in 1953, witnessed the worst of the fallout and faced difficult decisions about loyalty and patriotism as their faith in AEC radiation officials faded. Utah parents from this region became some of the most forceful advocates for reparations and apologies from the government in the 1980s when cases started finally working their way through the legal system. And some of our most compelling oral histories came from these folks who had amazing and often heartbreaking personal stories and remarkable perspective on the tensions between history and memory in the Atomic West. The hometown of Atomic Testing, Las Vegas, had a complicated relationship with this activity. Like the other huge federal projects that preceded it, Hoover Dam in the 1930s and Basic Magnesium in the 1940s, atomic testing brought jobs and money and a sense of patriot patriotic participation in an important national and global cause. Oral histories of Las Vegas participants and witnesses consistently revealed a combination of pride and fear. Public celebrations of atomic cocktails and bomb viewing parties hid deep concern and uncertainty among residents about the long-term human and environmental consequences of this most spectacular tourist attraction. That concern evolved into protest and it helps explain why there is a near universal hatred of the Yucca Mountain nuclear waste site in Nevada on both sides of the political parties. By 1957, the NTS was well established as an outdoor laboratory and experimental landscape central to US Cold War weapons development and host to an array of remarkable and often reckless government sponsored scientific activities. It was also the home to one of the most significant collections of laborers employed by the federal government and its contractors anywhere in the US. These numbers increased after the August 1963 limited test ban sent testing underground, requiring the construction of a Byzantine labyrinth that would have dazzled the tunnelmen of the gold rush who first excavated Nevada. Between 1963 and 1992, over 828 different underground complexes were excavated for 921 nuclear explosions. The only visible evidence of this extensive activities were hundreds of subsidence craters that covered and pockmarked the NTS. But below ground, one can visit the ruins of the working world of the Cold War and measure the economic costs in thousands of feet of million dollar cable, line of sight pipe, and millisecond closing containment doors that were ordered by the dozen at, a, at costs of now billions. The human and environmental costs are harder to quantify. The NTS was the atomic Comstock of the post-war West. 
In the social world of these diggings, there are engineers, miners, workers, cooks, prostitutes, barkeeps, sheriffs, and ranchers are every bit as interesting as those of the silver and gold communities a century earlier that so captivated uh, Mark Twain and other chroniclers of the 19th century Nevada. But like that earlier Comstock, the NTS was less a place of exceptional or exotic experience than one might assume. Even at its weirdest, the testing landscape of Nevada was populated by diverse people with familiar motives for migration, work, home, and dreams of quality of life on a new frontier. It was a place of racial, religious, and ethnic tensions and reconciliations familiar to the West. The people who called this region home were often conflicted about issues of patriotism and secrecy in the face of concerns of health and safety. The testing bioregion was known to all who experienced it as a harsh but rich and complex landscape, dominated by towering mountains and a remarkable diversity of subtle plant and animal life. The stories of atomic miners and ranchers in particular offer an interesting opportunity to answer, his, to answer historian Richard White's call to examine and claim work within nature, even if the work seems as fundamentally exceptional and unnatural as atomic weapons development and testing. Test site workers, miners especially, were excellent guides to the backcountry and subterranean world of the NTS. They knew the geology and topography better than anyone. Hundreds of them also lived for extended periods of time in the re most remote and beautiful high altitude sections of the NTS in a makeshift town known as Camp 12. Camp 12 was notorious for its boozing, fighting, and carousing inhabitants. The miners and laborers supported a strip of Highway 95 liquor stores and a booming brothel network outside the fences. The culture and economy of these NTS camps and their surrounding communities was characteristic of other atomic regions around the globe. The NTS had a twin in Soviet-era Kazakhstan. The British tested their weapons in both Nevada and Australia. In all locations, official government reports presented the testing regions as largely unoccupied and worthless. The Soviets made, shamelessly made, similar arguments about the significantly populated Polygon region, which had up to four million people living in it during the time of nuclear testing. The pattern was repeated in Algeria, Chile, China, India, Micronesia, and Pakistan, where areas described as wastelands, lightly inhabited by presumably irredeemable indigenous people, were sacrificed in the name of national security programs. In all of these places, scientists, engineers, miners, and laborers regularly encountered the supposedly absent inhabitants. British and American scientists lived with and were surrounded by Aboriginal people at the Maralinga test site in Australia and returned to the UK and the US with souvenir, bo souvenir boomerangs to prove it. Uh, in Kazakhstan, American uh, observers sent from various treaties with the Soviet Union to observe atomic testing there, knowing that they would encounter lots of local people brought toy bows and arrows and guns for the children that they encountered. Comparisons of globi global testing regions offer an interesting corollary to Ian Terrell's work on the racial character of land restoration and landscape creation. Terrell ar argues that the occupation of land by settler societies was underpinned by racially based perception of the deficiencies of both the people and the land. In the case of the testing landscapes, the process of deeming a region so utterly bereft of value 
that it could be systematically destroyed and unmade was also based on perceptions about land use, hierarchies of nature, patterns of inhabitation, and racial and religious prejudice deeply rooted, <coughs> rooted in the histories of the regions and the, the nations that were taking on these activities. I want to point out something in this slide that I think is especially interesting and worth noting. If you notice the banner here uh, that's hanging behind uh, Olas Solomonov, who was a leading uh, Cossack protester, uh, and the poster here, the modern state of Kazakhstan came from a shared protest between Nevada, Utah, and <coughs> the people of Kazakhstan around the fall of the Soviet Union. And I'll come, come back to that in just a minute. So during the Oral History Project, we encountered hundreds and really thousands of different people who had experienced nuclear testing. The numbers on participation are really stunning. Uh, the, the figure that I think most is conservative figure that's most accurate is around 300,000 people participated in nuclear testing at the Nevada test site. That includes soldiers that were sent there, workers, advisors, scientists, and a range of people. So kind of begs a question, which is, you know, with a cast of tens of thousands and even hundreds of thousands, uh, witnesses and actors, how did perceptions of testing regions persist as empty, worthless wildernesses? And part of the answer to that is this idea of the atomic sublime. And the atomic sublime took many forms, but the best known are the doom towns the fake towns that were constructed across the desert and then spectacularly destroyed with atomic weapons. The Doomtown history begins with an extensive series of civil effects atmospheric nuclear tests conducted in Nevada during the spring and summer of 1953. Civil effects was a euphemism coined by the federal defense planning agencies to describe nuclear weapon strikes on civilian targets. That summer, the NTS hosted two massive choreographed nuclear test series named Operation Doorstep and Operation Q. Workers and soldiers converged on the newly established outdoor laboratory to construct villages of houses complete with mannequin residents dressed in clothes from the local Las Vegas J.C. Penney store. Cars were purchased in Las Vegas, numbered and tracked or driven up to the test site and placed strategically across the desert landscape. Dummy drivers were placed in the cars and situated in the houses. Food was put in the refrigerator. Uh, and if you've ever seen the last Indiana Jones, you've seen a, a, a very Hollywood version of this. And to preemptively answer your question, if you hid in a refrigerator during a nuclear blast, it would do you no good uh, at all. Um, <coughs> for these tests, one of the things that was so unusual about them, and made them so powerful and their impact so lasting, is that the government decided to invite people to watch and to televise it uh, in order to present a view of nuclear testing to the public. 600 citizens representing every state were invited to come in person and watch the blasts and see the frightening power of atomic weapons to obliterate and irradiate. An unprecedented army of television crews joined them and brought the blasts home to what would ultimately be an audience of 15 million. And this was one of the most important events in the history of television. It was the first time anybody tried to do a, a live, very remote, broadcast of history that was about to unfold and the, the stories of the TV crews that tried to put this on out in the Nevada desert, very, very interesting. The Doomtown images that emerged from these events are still mesmerizing, even after all these years. The best known sequence, and this might be familiar to you, and you can watch all of these on YouTube now and kind of again and again, the best-known sequence shows a nicely constructed typical American family home, 
obliterated in super slow motion during the first three seconds of a nuclear blast. First, it eerily lights up the building, then shaking violently in the fury of a nuclear wind before bursting into flames and blowing apart. One of my favorite interviews in our oral history collection was with a man named Vernon Jones, who was a photographer and was one of the guys who was sent out in 1953 to capture these images. Uh, and his story is incredibly interesting because he didn't really have the background to know how to deal with any of this. His photography background was pretty limited, but he had to devise and build techniques of photographing uh, it, in very, very fast sequences. He had to devise ways of shielding photographic equipment, which then, of course, relied on film from massive amounts of radiation, which erased film. So the complications on a technical level were just huge. Uh, but what also kind of blew me away, and this was common, was him just describing his very, very close encounters with nuclear blasts, being out with a box in the desert, adjusting his camera that he'd worked on so hard, uh, two in the morning, in the dark, uh, with wild animals around, uh, and, and a clock literally ticking down to when the atomic bomb that was sitting in a tower was going to go off, and how close these guys would cut it uh, before they ran away to get a presumably safe distance from these things happening really, you know, had to be heard to be believed. And the stories of the photographers are just amazing. Uh, another one of the most famous photographers of the era was a man named Don English, who took some iconic images, some of which I'm showing here, uh, and also just an incredible oral history with him describing all of the sensations that accompany an atomic blast, the, the way it feels when it hits you, the way it looks, the way it smells, the way it sounds, uh, what the colors are like. And those kinds of descriptions firsthand of something that very, very few humans, thankfully, have ever seen live really add a richness to the historical record that you just simply can't get from traditional documentary sources. So, the atomic sublime and perceptions of Nevada as an empty wasteland, safe for testing, were not just an accident. Careful curation of images and film consistently edited out environmental and cultural context. The, the most iconic footage of the destruction of Desert Doomtown operations between 1953 and 1957 circulated throughout the world creating a lasting impression of atomic Armageddon, human vulnerability, and in the case of Nevada, a welcome environmental and cultural emptiness to justify the testing of our weapons on home soil and to prepare our defenses. And these images also contributed to the rise of a global anti-nuclear movement. The NTS was a remarkable node of transnational exchange Goods, technologies, ideas, and peoples, vast sums of money from across the globe flowed in, isotopes, images, prototypes, experience, and expertise and wages flowed out. Global protesters gathered around the test site to protest, and they too became experienced chroniclers of the land. With our public history project, one of the most remarkable opportunities we had was at the end of everything we had done in Nevada and Utah was a U.S. State Department grant that enabled us to have a phase three where we went to Kazakhstan with a team of researchers to conduct similar research in those areas and to look at these same issues, the atomic sublime, uh, to think about different ways people had interpreted this history, to get a sense of what did do these testing landscapes look like who were the people, and how were they affected? So in 2014, we traveled to Kazakhstan to conduct oral histories, create a documentary film, and visit sites associated with Soviet nuclear history, especially cultural sites and museums that interpreted this history. One of the things that we found that didn't surprise us was a lot of protagonist-created art. 
NTS participants who came to Nevada assuming it was a mostly empty wasteland only found that it was not, but then quickly discovered that they had become invisible by virtue of being there. Because of secrecy, they weren't allowed to talk about the, what they did, they weren't allowed to tell anybody what they did, so they felt invisible. But one way that they could use alternative forms to record these remarkable experiences was art. And a kind of an astonishing array of people who were not artists spent a lot of time creating art. Uh, and this art was insider-outsider art, people who knew a lot uh, and had a story to tell and could only tell it visually. Some of it was nuclear combat art and craft created by those who lived and worked throughout the testing region. And all of it captured their views of land, labor, science, technology, and historic events. It ranged from professional to amateur and took many forms, from formal oil paintings and carefully composed photography uh, to official combat sketches, atomic poetry, and even songs. For those participating in U.S. testing following military tradition, certificates, patches, and stickers, and other insignia were issued following each event. And these officially sanctioned folk art souvenirs served the dual purpose of fostering a sense of exclusive community and shared purpose while supporting a culture of secrecy and restriction. Nuclear testing officers and administrators encouraged us because they knew it helped build a sense of community and hoped it would continue outside. Uh, but the art sometimes subverted that goal because in the certificates, if you carefully read them, in many of the pieces of art, problems with health and safety, questions about the politics and legitimacy and morality of atomic testing are hidden in there. So they became cryptic ways for people to protest. Finally, official photography and film footage like that captured by Vernon Jones often transcended documentary purposes and captured a sense of place and emotion beyond its intended purpose. Some of the photographs documenting science and labor in the Mojave Desert are as spectacular as works of art that convey a sense of place and power as those of Lang and Adams and the other professional pho photographers who roamed the region at the same time. Over time, these artifacts inspired successive generations of regional artists who interpreted <laughs> official documents and artifacts in their own productions. Formally trained artists from the Nevada test site region naturally turned to the subject of atomic testing, as it was a defining factor of life in history in the region. The poorly understood dangers of lingering radiation throughout the region qualified basically everyone living in Nevada, Utah, and the broader atomic testing region as a protagonist, and many turned to art to explain their feelings and thinking about this issue, and it's still true today. There's an astonishing array of atomic art. It's a whole subgenre. So what do you do with research results like oral testimony from people like Vernon Jones, sculptures and paintings and things created by protagonists who'd been there, photo collections that had never seen the light of day, uh, and then a huge array of traditional primary sources. Uh, the answer for most of us who worked on this project was first to turn to traditional academic forms. The lead researcher of the project, Liesl Childers, produced an amazing monograph called The Size of the Risk. Uh, I wrote about uh, visual analysis in academic journals. And there were a number of humanities institutes and National Park Service events taking the traditional research results and coming up with academic type products. But for me, and for many of us who participated, there's a recognition with oral history that it's actually very hard to translate oral history into a traditional academic product. It's difficult to do justice to long, long interviews uh, in a way that, uh, thank you in a way that really represents those as a meaningful source that can help you transcend and add something new to the historic record. But visual representation of 
oral testimony works exceptionally well. And it's not surprising when you think of it that there is a genre of graphic history, uh, and most people are familiar at least with this example, uh, that is ha face the similar issue of what do you do with oral testimony and how can you represent it and get it into the hands of an audience. Uh, and Mouse kind of led the way, and it's a book that's been assigned in college classrooms for years and years. But there's some other really amazing examples. And for me, the book The Photographer was kind of a, a eureka moment where a very complicated transnational history had been interpreted through a combination of documentary photography, traditional primary sources, but also graphic results. The reason I think thought this, this was an important thing to pay attention to is that in my field of environmental history, visual analysis toward new insights is an important trend. And a question in my mind after doing a huge amount of visual analysis that resulted from oral history was, could you take it a step further and use visual analysis to create new research insights and results, but then present them also in a visual format of some kind. And these are some of the books that offered a little inspiration for how that might actually be possible. But the question, obviously, if you tell people you're going to do a graphic history, which people's immediate response is, do you mean like a graphic novel? And you say, or a comic book? Say, so, yes and no. Uh, not, not a comic book, for sure. Uh, like a graphic novel, yes, but a graphic history, uh, real history, not a representation and not a move away from the methodologies embraced by historians. So how do you do this and can you do this? Can you do rigorous academic work and present it as graphic history? And to what extent can oral history linked to visual history drive a historical narrative that would make sense to a reader. Uh, big question for those who use visual analysis in any way uh, in scholarly work is that can you, can you use images of a wide variety of types as primary sources, not simply as illustrations? And if so, then how could you go one step beyond and use those to make an interpretation? Uh, can visual history doing this reveal new insights about a subject like atomic history uh, while offering an accessible entry point uh, to a range of audiences? One of the things we realized with our oral history project is that there's an extraordinary lack of, of clear understanding of this history uh, for some of the reasons I just explained, but it's also, it's very, very complicated. Uh, it's big, it's global, it happens over a long span of time, and it involves a lot of complicated science and technology. So could you use this alternative forum to kind of, as a gateway to bring people into a subject they might not be willing to take on otherwise? For me, practical considerations like how much text can you eliminate? Uh, if visuals are driving the narrative and you're obviously leaving out uh, a lot of information. Uh, historians like to write and explain very carefully what it is that we do. Uh, and you're proposing in this forum to leave a lot out. And what could the visual images do to replace what was being left out? And a, and a practical question, what it, would it be like as a scholar to collaborate with an artist? So I came up with a system to, to to achieve these goals and to work with an, an artist. And it was a kind of a natural step for me because all of the public history projects that preceded this book were collaborative. The, the definition from the American Historical Association of what constitutes uh, public history and what differentiates it from more traditional history is that it's collaborative. Uh, so me continuing the collaborative process was natural, but it required some actual thinking about mechanically how would I collaborate with a person who's working strictly in visual form when I'm working in a traditional text form. So 
in a nutshell, I wrote the entire book, the, just the entire manuscript uh, of the book, close to 400 pages, but one section of it were pages that looked like this. And they were pages that were designed by me to tell the traditional story, to muster a wide range of sources in the way that a historian would, to provide very careful citation. It was the footnotes and the endnotes for every single word, every single image that would appear in the graphic history, but then to be able to give direction to the artist for how to interpret that. So sometimes it was embedding a primary document uh, into the sequential narrative. Uh, it was using documentary uh, photographic images from archives as the basis for specific aspects of interpretation. It was then bringing in classical primary documents to inform the discussion and building from the oral testimony of people who had participated there so that the dialogue was literally the dialogue of the person who was doing this. And working with an artist who was based in the UK was challenging, so we had to, I put in hundreds of hours on Skype. And I had notes, and I had all the things that historians normally have as they're producing a research work. But he would sketch, uh, and so we would discuss various things. And one of the things I had to try and explain to him is that on a page, although I'm not going to say it, the thesis of the page is scientific uncertainty. So in the tone of the images, in the way you're depicting the action, it's not supposed to be celebratory. It is because the thesis of the page and based on the research is this was a high moment of uncertainty. So trying to work with an artist to talk about representing ideas and arguments was interesting. And what he did is create a series of mock pages that would go from very, very sketchy, very, very drafty forms aiming toward the page of a graphic history and always very carefully linked to sources. So essentially the whole book was footnoted, uh, although in the book you don't see the footnote because there's really not a place for it on the page, but I have them. And some of the pages were intended to be very simple. And the other thing that we were trying to do was show how historians know what they know, to talk about how people of the time knew what they knew, to, so that readers can understand the complexity and the contentiousness of this history. So sometimes a page was just highlighting an influential source of information for people at the time. Sometimes a page, and this is one of my favorites, was using a combination of oral testimony and documentary images from the archive and newly found documentary images to create a new story of a critical moment. That's the moment when the US evacuated Bikini Islanders prior to the atomic tests. And it was interpreted and still is by the US government in a very specific way, which is this was OK because there are tens of thousands of these little islands. They're all the same. Uh, and the existing interpretation for a long time made that argument, but we found uh, lots of information to support that that was not the case. So representing those kinds of new sources alongside familiar ones could be the goal of a page. Sometimes I shot for no dialogue at all uh, or as minimal dialogue as possible to try and see if the visuals alone could convey a sense of emotion, and especially with topics where emotion uh, at the time was the thing you were most interested in conveying. So uh, on the left here was the irradiating of the ship, the Lucky Dragon, uh, during the Bravo test, which was a defining moment in the history of global nuclear protests. Uh, and the images of these, uh, fishermen, Japanese fishermen, who got heavily irradiated and then brought back loads of irradiated fish that actually made it onto Japanese and US markets before the Atomic Energy Commission could resolve this situation because the blast had been so big. So trying to convey that with just images. Uh, and on the left is, is this area, really. It's using some of Dorothea Lange's images from Three Mormon Towns 
to try and give a sense of place and to try just very simply to convey to readers who don't live in this area, who don't understand what the, this region is like, uh, that it was a place, a real place with real people, with real history, uh, that it was beautiful, uh, and that it wasn't a wasteland. So lots of efforts throughout the book to use art to convey the simple idea that this history was happening in places and there were people there. Lots of challenges to doing this. And as Brendan said, my book had an out in the sense that it's a graphic history, but it is bookended by lots of traditional history. So I was comforted by the fact that even when we were going crazy with the images, there was a lot of footnoted <coughs> traditional scholarship binding it. So that, that is essentially my cheat which is creating a set of sections in the book that would bring primary documents and sources to the reader, explaining the meaning of those sources, and in many cases, publishing sources that had never been seen. And this is one example that had been seen, but an amazing series of images of Bikini Islanders right on the day before evacuation. An astonishing set of images that came from an oral interviewee showing irradiated islanders that had never been seen before and were actually in a shoebox uh, in the archives of the National Atomic Testing Museum. And a set of images of bomb blasts as they looked to citizens who were living in Las Vegas at the time. So not rendered in any way, just that's actually what it looked like to see those images. Lots of narrative decisions too. How do you, you know, get, make this story have relevance when it to start in the beginning? and literally give people a tour through the region. Uh, I used an, a narrator, a man named Gladwin Hill, who was a really remarkable uh, witness and was the lead atomic reporter for the New York Times, later went on to become the first environmental reporter for the New York Times. And Hill was kind of an amazing narrator in the sense that he witnessed everything. He was sent to and had access to everything, and he wrote about it beautifully. Uh, and his views evolved and changed. He came to Nevada from New York. He had no appreciation for the Mojave Desert or places like Utah. Uh, but he became, over a period of 10 years, one of the most eloquent chroniclers of this region, and somebody who had a profound appreciation for the people. He spent a lot of time in Utah going to tiny villages and interviewing people about their experiences and went on to uh, be a very important figure in the American environmental movement in the 1970s. So I wrapped up the graphic portion of the history but with the global context and this remarkable alliance between Nevada and Kazakhstan, uh, which was also, as I said, shared by people around the world. And the there, there's a big history in this book that I've barely touched on of the remarkable similarities between the experiences of indigenous peoples around the world who lived in these supposed wastelands and have an experience that is really unique to human history. These are the only people on earth who have lived atomic warfare and know what it's like. They've seen it, smelled it, felt it, uh, painted it, drawn it, written about it and talked about it. So I wanted to conclude with that set of connections. So I'll stop there. Thank you. If any students need to, to get up and go to the next class, we'll give you a few seconds. And we do have room for a little bit um, to ask Dr. Kirk to ask a question. Questions? So uh, this may be difficult to estimate, but comparing 
the time and effort it took to create this work to a traditional monograph, academic like uh, you know, work. Yeah, good. How could you, could you quantify that? Good, good question. Many, many times that I was sitting in my office thinking, why? <laughs> why did I decide to do this? Because it does have so many moving parts and such an array of just astonishing resources that could be brought to bear on this story. And the, and the meth methodology to do it right is tedious and time consuming. And collaboration can be tedious and time consuming. And I think even the staunchest public history proponents of academic collaboration of any kind would admit, as we all know, doing a group project is often harder than doing it by yourself. Uh, and you have to be able to truly collaborate. You have to really, it's not just somebody ordering somebody around. And in my case, I had to collaborate with somebody who needed artistic license. So I could direct on the side of history and scholarship, but I didn't want to direct him away from his own artistic sensibilities, which were based and grounded in history. That's how I found him. And were sophisticated and really interesting. And his ideas always made me think very hard about aspects of history and how they might be shared with others, how you get your ideas on a page. So it was really time consuming. Uh, I basically did write a full research monograph and then turn it into something else that was even bigger. So <clears throat> much more time consuming. But because I was the director of a public history program and because so much effort went into these projects, which won awards and uh, were, had fantastic results, I wanted to try and sort of accept the challenge of can you d do this public history and then make it into a public history publication. Initially, the goal was simply to create a digital history project of oral, oral histories of the atomic region. We did that. And that project won a prize for doing that. So that was it. It was done. Uh, but then it just kind of took on a life of its own. And also was very well funded. The, the life of its own came with money. So tricky. The caption, captions seem like they're an art unto themselves. Was that something you did? Did you have to, how did you pick up the ability? Yeah, so my, my, I have never had so much attention from my children for my work as when I was sitting in my office with piles of what looked like comic books, pouring through them intently and them asking, what are you doing? And why are you doing this? Because I was not into that on my own prior to this. Uh, really, Mouse was the only book I was very familiar with. Uh, and one of the things I was trying to learn is captioning. And how do you, can you represent different voices by types of captions? So a yellow box, uh, a bubble. And there, there is a, a real art and science to doing that that has been studied, that readers will recognize who's speaking and how it's working and which direction to move based on how you do that. And so I borrowed from and actually had to learn that art because it's a brutally concise format. There's so much you can't do. And if you, I could have shown you some original drafts where it's all caption and you can barely see what the picture is because I'm just writing, writing, and writing, and writing. And uh, Christian, my collaborator, would say, this all seems really important, but c nobody can see the picture. Like, you're right, it's got to be trimmed down. So you can't do things like, say, as so-and-so said, or according to Gladwin Hill on that morning. You, I mean, you have to, they, the reader has to just get that, and the captions help do that. So I learned a lot about sequential art and captioning, and even the way you make the boxes and use the gutter, the spaces in between, as a transition in the same way that a writer uses a, a, a prose transition to get you from one point to another point logically, uh, so that you're moving the reader in a way that they'll understand what you're talking about. 
regardless of their familiarity with the topic. So it's really, you know, translating the techniques of a writer to the techniques of people who represent almost visually as, you know, it was probably excellent for my brain uh, because it, it was not familiar to me at all. And I was pretty far outside my comfort zone at the beginning. A bit of a what if question. Since you were, I don't know if lucky is the right word, but you were, you had a narrator mm -hmm. that you could use. If you hadn't had a reporter, did you think about any other ways to craft that narrative? Yeah, I really didn't intend to use a narrator. But as I, I, had, I knew about Gladwin Hill, I knew about his works that were hugely influential around the world because he was the person writing in the New York Times about these events. So he had a huge, huge audience. And he was sent to Nevada in 1951 to cover the very first explosion. And he left in the early 60s. So he witnessed the entire era of atomic atmospheric testing. And as I said, his journey as a witness was, it worked perfectly, and most importantly, he left a very, very good archival collection at UCLA. And he was an, you know, a war correspondent in World War II, so he had little leather journals where he kept all his notes. And UCLA has hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these journals and notepads and notes. And so he was writing his thoughts and what it looked like, and, and this is what it smelled like. And when I went out to Ash Creek, or when I was in you know, Lehigh, or these places around the region, he was an outsider. So he did a lot of like, what does it look like? Who are these people? And what do they do here? How do they get here? So he was just a perfect narrator. And <clears throat> I don't know what I would have done without him, because I thought, the, the primary intended audience of this book would be college students who are not going to have a chance to read Richard Rhodes' Pulitzer Prize winning book and they're not going to delve too deep into nuclear history because they don't have time unless that's their topic. So trying to get an overarching sense of a very complicated story but quick enough uh, that you could get in there but that's why the narrative seemed important. They needed a guide that could say sometimes, not just show. Would, sorry, would you have considered using, would you have ever considered maybe inventing a narrator or was that just off the table? Yeah, I, I had that in there. You know, one of the limitations of this method, which I feel very confident about every box of this thing is I could say this is what is, it's, it's real, it's not made up. It's not fiction, it's history. It's the same way you'd make a paragraph and cite it. Uh, but the limitation of that is it's, it's literal and there were times, believe me, when I thought, man, wouldn't it have been great if Gladwin Hill had met this person and they had a conversation about the following and I could have knocked those pages out instantly. But it didn't happen, you know. So I, I never wanted I did not want to go there. Yeah, I actually did a book with, on uh, three Mormon towns with the Oakland Museum oh. of California. And so it was interesting. I had a similar problem, but in reverse, because we were coming from the art perspective, and we had to ingest history. And we'd confront you know, the, the needs of history with the needs of art yeah. routinely. And I mean, it's an interesting conflict. I mean, history always wants more the bigger, and art wants to keep things precise. I mean, even to the point, Dorothy Lange and Ansel Adams, they didn't keep caption information when they photographed. Like, Life magazine had to go back and get it for them after the fact. Right. And so, um, I don't know, like, and like the team, like I let, it was my book, I edited it, I guess. And, but, you know, but we'd have the art side and the history side, and they were always the loggerheads. It was, it was very difficult I, because of that conflict. And it's interesting to me that you did it, you know, you took history and then adapted it to art. Yeah, and I mean, visual sources, just like any source, you have to look at them with a critical eye. Yeah. And th the three Mormon towns images, as you sound like the leading expert on, but they're complicated images. Yeah, no, it's a really complicated project. Right? And yeah. the, the circumstance, the way they decided to do those interpretations of this region, you know, not crystal clear 
not everyone agrees on the way they did it. Uh, for, from the historian point of view, awesome way of representing life in a region that you're trying to find at least some, some sense of life in that region conveyed at a critical moment. And their timing was perfect. 1953 was the critical year uh, when radiation becomes an issue, especially in this area with sheep deaths. Thank you if there are no, no more. Happy, I can talk about this forever. It was a really interesting project and I appreciate your interest.